Welcome to Just Grace It, a production of Grace Life Bible Church dedicated to teaching and establishing believers in the principles of the Grace Life. Let's join Pastor Brian Ross, rightly dividing the word and discussing grace through faith. Now, grace, folks, by definition, is you and I not getting what we deserve. The law is a principle that says you get what you deserve. Grace is a principle that is exactly the opposite, and it says... It, that we don't get what we deserve. Do we deserve the wrath of God in our natural state, in our sinfulness? We deserve, do we deserve on the basis of our performance and because we're just such great, wonderful people, lovable people, do we deserve eternal life and salvation? No. It is a gift of what? Grace. Grace, by definition, is exactly the opposite. Grace is, is you and I not getting what we deserve. Now, Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines grace with the following. Number one, favor, goodwill, kindness. Okay? The free, unmerited love and favor of God. The spring and source of all the benefits that men receive from Him. Grace is unearned and undeserved honor and favor from God. Now, if Israel's out there in the land, and there's crop failure and famine, and their enemies are oppressing them, what does Israel know? That they sinned, that they didn't keep the law, and that God's cursing them, and that they're getting what they want, deserve, based on the terms of the law. Grace is exactly the opposite, folks. Grace is you and I not getting what we deserve, and all the blessings that we have as members of the church, the body of Christ, are based upon and are, giving, and are given to us uh, based upon the principle of grace, of God not giving us what we deserve, but giving us instead and implying the righteousness and the benefits and the righteousness of God to our account. That's why we, we look at grace here, define grace, if you look at the word as God's Riches at Christ's expense. Did Christ pay the whole price necessary? Yes. So on virtue of the fact that Christ did all the work, He shed His blood, He died in our place, He, he, he died where we should have us, He suffered our second death for us, and so forth. And because of that, now God is able on the basis of grace to give us eternal life as a free gift, something that we do not want deserve. So law and grace, folks, are mutually exclusive systems. The law is a system where you get what you deserve. Grace is a system where you don't get what you deserve. Now, come with me if you would to Romans chapter 5. Come to Romans chapter 5. And apparently I did forget to put the uh, Romans chapter 5, that's page uh, 1197 in the, the Bible. Romans chapter 5. Verse 20. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound. Now look at verse, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Verse 8, or I'm sorry, the end of the verse 20. But where sin abounded, grace did what? Much more about. Folks, grace, by its very definition, okay? You know, you know, listen to what I'm saying. Grace, by its very definition, implies that it can be abused. Or it would not be grace. Now the question, the question of should you abuse the grace of God, that's a different question. We're going to get to that question in a minute. But grace by its very definition implies that it can be abused or else it would not be what? Grace. Look at the verse. Moreover the law entered that, that the offense might abound, but where sin what? Abounded, grace did much more what? Abound. God always has more grace, folks, than you and I have sin. 
Okay? There is, there, is, there is infinitely more grace that God has abounding toward our account than, than our ability to sin and to use up the grace of God that He's, that he's demonstrating on our behalf. You remember last Saturday when I, we were talking about how that in the ages to come he was gonna he was gonna show forth uh, show, show to the church the body of Christ the riches of grace and so on and so forth there in Ephesians chapter two there is a there is a treasure trove of grace that God is 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 wilf, willfully abounding toward us in that there is always more grace to cover the things that we do wrong the times that we mess up the times that we don't do what we should do and so on and so forth now does that mean then That because there's always more grace than sin, then we should just use that as an opportunity to serve the flesh and willfully disobey God and His Word. The answer is what? No, that's not what grace is about. But let me tell you something, and I believe this with all my heart. If you have a proper understanding of grace, you will know and understand that grace is capable of being what? abused, because that's what makes grace, grace. Now, should we abuse it? The obvious answer is what? No, we should not. But we have to have a proper understanding of what grace is. Grace and law are two mutually exclusive systems. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Paul Paul raises this very question in Romans 6, and he says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may what? Now doesn't Paul, Paul there, he, he, he addresses the exact question, right? If you are told that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, what's the obvious thing that you'd ask next? Well then I can go do whatever I want to do, right? If there's always more grace than sin, then it doesn't matter. I, sh- I can go out, I can behave, I can live, I can function, however it is that I feel like it, without any fear of of reprisal or repercussion on the part of God, and so I'm just going to go do what I want. Then Paul in Romans 6, he addresses the very question that we're discussing, and he says, What then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? So does Paul admit that if the Romans continue to sin, there's always enough grace on the part of God to cover that sin? But then he says in verse 2, what's the answer? God forbid... How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer what? Therein. So grace, folks, is not to be abused. It is capable of being abused, but Paul never teaches, nor does anybody in my mind that really understands grace teach that grace is a license to sin and to go do whatever you want whenever you feel like it. Look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under what? Grace. Grace can be abused. Grace should not be abused. Grace, folks, ought to be the thing that motivates us to do the right thing. Okay? Out of gratitude to God for what He has already done for us. Now, what's the motivation of the law? The motivation of the law is fear, right? You step out of line and what? You're going to get smacked, right? You're going to get cursed. You're going to get punished for not not keeping the law. That's what it said in Deuteronomy 28. Now, grace, we ought to do the right thing, being motivated by grace, Understanding that God is no longer, that, that, God, that we're at peace with God, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And the grace of God ought to not be something that we use as an excuse to sin, but it ought to be something that we use as a motivation to go and live rightly in Christ Jesus. Now, come with me to, <clears throat> come with me to Romans 3. What then, seems to me that a logical question then becomes, well then what's the lawful use of the law? What purpose, then, does the law serve? <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 19. <coughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. Now what's the next, ver- what's the next word? That. The purpose and the intent. 
Circle in your Bible if you need to. That. It's going to tell you the purpose and the intent. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before who? What is it, folks, that declares the world guilty? God's law. The law of God, the righteous standards of God, are put before a, a, a sin-cursed world, and on the basis of those rightful, on the basis of those standards, the law proclaims everyone what? Guilty. That's what the verse says. Look at ver end of verse 19 again. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, if the law is what declares the sinner guilty, then verse 20, therefore. Or, in other words, on the basis that every mouth is stopped and declared guilty before God in verse 19, on the basis of the law, he now says in verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Here it is. For by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. Folks, how do people know that they're a sinner? According to what Paul's saying here. They know they're a sinner because the law stands out there as God's righteous standard and demands perfect obedience and perfect application all the time. And we as human beings don't do that. And by not doing that, it stops the mouth of the sinner. It declares the world guilty before God. And it's by the law then that man has a knowledge of what? Sin. Look at verse 28. Drop down to verse 28. Paul says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified how? By faith without the deeds of the law. Now, can the deeds of the law save you? No. The deeds of the law are not capable of saving you. Why? Because Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and, do and done what? Come short. So if God's righteous standard is here... Our best efforts on our best day will always leave us what? Short of God's righteous standard. So what needed to happen is God sent His Son to pay off our sin, to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, so that you and I, by virtue of coming through the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ, could now have access to God the Father and be given salvation, not based on the works of the law, but that we could now be justified by what? Faith. Okay? Come to Galatians chapter 3. Come over to Galatians chapter 3. Now, the Galatians, Paul had gone through the region of Galatia and he had taught them the gospel of the grace of God. He had taught them the fact that the law only declares them guilty before God. He taught them that the law stops the mouth of the sinner. He taught them that they will always fall short of the righteous standards of the law. And, he, and he, what he taught them was that they're saved by grace through faith. He taught them to trust and rely exclusively on Christ's shed blood, His death on the cross, and His resurrection from the dead as the only complete payment for their sin. And then after Paul left the region of Galatia, who comes in after him? The Judaizers. These people that are seeking to put them back under what? A law system. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, <clears throat> that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth and crucified among you, this only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of what? Faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by what? The flesh. Now what had happened in Galatia? Paul had came in there and he taught them the gospel of the grace of God. He'd gotten them saved and understood some things about grace. And then as soon as Paul left, these religious performance people moved in after him and sought to compel the Galatians and bring them back under what system? A law system. And he says to them, you, are you foolish? Who's bewitched you? Who has played tricks on your mind? Who, who has done this to you that you, uh, verse 1, that ye should not obey what? The truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth and crucified among you. See, the Galatians had fallen back under 
the law performance system as a means of holy and righteous living. And Paul says, you guys have missed the point. Go to Galatians 5. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify that every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole what? Law, all of it, not just the Ten Commandments, but all 613 commandments, the entire law. James, the, 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 the writer, the, the Apostle James that writes James, he talks about the fact that if a man offends in one point, he's guilty of what? All. How many chains, how many links in a chain have to break for that chain to break? One. How many laws does somebody have to break before they violated the righteous law of God and are now a lawbreaker? One. And Paul says here, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ, look at verse 4, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from what? Grace. Why? Why are they fallen from grace? Because Romans chapter 11 said that if you have grace and you add works to it, it's no longer what? grace. So it was very clear, folks, that the Apostle Paul expected the Galatians and us, following his teaching here, to not put ourselves back under what? The law. But to live out our Christian life of faith and service to him on the principle and on the basis, not of, the, not of works, not of law, but on the basis and principle of grace. Come with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. Now, verse 6. <coughs> Paul's writing here, verse 6. He says, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they what? Folks, this is the Apostle Paul's words, not mine. But anybody today that wants to teach the law for either justification being made right with God, salvation, or sanctification, holy, holy living rightly in Christ Jesus. Anybody that wants to teach the law for either one of those purposes, Paul says that they don't know what they're what? Doing. They don't know what they're talking about, and they don't know what they're doing, he says, end, end of verse 7. He says, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. Now look at verse 8. But we know that the law is good <coughs> if a man use it how? Lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for who? A righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient and ungodly and for sinners and for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Folks, who is the law for? Is the law for a believer? Is the law for somebody who's trusted Christ, died on the cross for their sins, shed his blood, and rose again? Is the law for that person? No, the law is for the person that has not trusted that message. Why? We've already know the answer to that based on what we've studied. Because all the law can do is stop the mouth and convict the person of their own what? Sin. That's why when Paul says that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, he says that the lawful use of the law is, is not for the righteous man, it's for the sinner, it's for the unholy, it's for the profane. It's for all those people that are doing things that are contrary to sound doctrine. He says that's who the law is for, and the law is not for a righteous man. 
Christ has already fulfilled the require, righteous requirements of the law, and if you're a believer, you're in Christ. So the law has no more purpose for you. The law's purpose for you is fulfilled if it brought you to the place where you've understood your sin, and you've understood that you couldn't save yourself, and that the only way you could have a relationship with God is to accept what His Son Jesus Christ did for you. Once you believe that, the law no longer has any purpose for you. Because it has fulfilled its purpose. Come with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. See, Paul says there's nothing wrong with the law. He says the law is what? It's good. If a man use it what? Lawfully. There's a lot of unlawful use of the law going around today, folks, in professing Christendom. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? What's the answer? God forbid. Absolutely not. No way. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not what? How did Paul know that it was wrong to desire something that didn't belong to him? The law said, Thou shalt not covet. How do you know it's wrong to go 100 miles down Lake Michigan Drive? Because there's a little sign there that says speed limit 35, or whatever it is. How, what is it? I don't even know. What is it? 30, 40? Whatever. It depends where you're at, right? Okay. But my point is this. You don't know what the law is, or that something is wrong, unless there's a law that says it's wrong. Right? So, Paul says, listen, I didn't know what lust was, except the law told me, thou shalt not what? Covet. So Paul said that he learned, <clears throat> he learned what lust was because there was a law that said that he should not covet and desire things that did not belong to him. So the law taught him what that lust was sin, that covetousness was sin, based on the fact that God put a standard out there that said, Thou shalt not covet. So again, folks, we see that the purpose of the law is to manifest sin. And because the purpose of the law is to manifest sin and to declare the world guilty before God, then there is a lawful use and a lawful purpose for the law. And the lawful use and purpose of the law is not for the righteous. It's not for the believer. It's not for the one that's already trusted in Jesus Christ. It's for the one that is unsaved. For the purpose of, a, of acknowledging and manifesting their own sin before Almighty God. And once you've acknowledged that, and once you've embraced God's provision by grace through faith, the law no longer serves any purpose for you and I except to condemn us. If you want to try to follow it. As you're saved this morning, folks, the law has already fulfilled its purpose for you. Now, the next point I want to look at So we understand that law and grace are different. They're mutually exclusive systems. We understand that there's a lawful purpose for the law. That it's not made for the righteous man, it's made for the unholy and profane and, so, and sinner and so on and so forth. We understand that there are people today, like, the, like was going on in Galatia, that are trying to condemn, or trying to um, compel people to follow and keep the law. The question then becomes, well, how do, you, how do you and I then as believers walk in the Spirit? Come with me if you would to Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> Verse 16. This I say, that walk in the Spirit, 
and you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is that what it said? No. It said, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill what? The lust of the flesh. So if you and I are walking in the Spirit, according to that verse, are we going to be fulfilling the lust of the flesh? What's the answer? No. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Now, if you're honest, you know exactly what that verse is talking about. Because you have in your conscience, in your inner man, all the time an, an ongoing struggle between what you want to do and what you know you should do. Right? There are two opposed... It's like, it's like taking the same ends of a battery and trying to put them together. What happens? It repels. Right? So it says here, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Now notice, and these are what? Contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye what? How many of you know what this verse is talking about? We know what the right thing is. We even have a desire to go do the right thing, and we want to do what's right. But yet somehow we find ourselves doing what we know we shouldn't want. Now why is that? The reason that is is because Paul is telling you that in the, light, in the inner man of a believer, you have the flesh that wants one thing, and you have the spirit that wants what? Something else. And they are contrary the one to the other. So one is pulling you one direction, and the other one is pulling you in the opposite direction. And so what we do is th these opposing forces, these opposing poles, if you will, in the believer, often leave us not doing the things that we would, the things that we know we should. Verse 18. You need
you hear me now? Like that Verizon commercial? Can you hear me now? Okay. 1 Corinthians 6. Sorry about the uh, interruption. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that, that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor, nor revelers, or, uh, revelers yeah, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now look at verse, look at verse uh, 11. Well, by the way, you look at that list there in verse 9 and 10, and are there a bunch of things in that list that showed up in Galatians 5? Fornication, idolatry, uh, adultery, abuse of themselves and mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revelers, so on and so forth, right? We already know from the other passage that all those things are the works of what? The flesh. Then look at verse, look at verse 11. Paul says to the Corinthians, and such, what's the next word? Were. Is were past, present, or future tense? It's past tense. He says, such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, here's the point. When you and I go out and act... In fornication, idolatry, adultery, uh, effeminate, abusers of selves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, so on and so forth. When we do those things, we are behaving like the saved ought to behave, or like the unsaved actually do behave. Because he clearly says to the Corinthians in verse 11, And such were some of you. Paul identifies the fact, folks, in Galatians 5, that the believer is either walking in the Spirit or walking after the flesh. We already went through that. I've got to catch up here. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, there are two kinds of people in the passage. There are the saved, in verse 11, that have been sanctified, justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now, is it inappropriate, then, for the Corinthians that are sanctified, justified, and so forth, and, and, and possessors of the Spirit of God, is it inappropriate for them to then go back and live the way they were living before they were saved? Yes, that's the point here. In verse 9 and 10, the people who commit these sins are, and therefore will not inherit the kingdom of God are clearly not saved people. In verse 11, Paul tells the Corinthians that they used to be like the people in verses 9 and 10, but upon salvation have undergone a change in identity and affiliation. He says, such were. That's how you used to be. That's who you were in your past. But that's not who you are now. Who are the Corinthians now in verse 11? But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So for the Corinthians then, to go back and live like the, like the people in verse 9 and 10, is that appropriate for them as believers or is that inappropriate for them as believers? It's not fitting, it's not compatible with the new identity that they have in Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, the people described in verse 9 and 10... Those are the people for whom the law was what? Made. Galatians 5. When the, I'll just refer to it now. When the Galatians, and us for that matter, walk in these sins. Why don't you, let's go back to Galatians 5. When we walk in this manner, we are living like the unsaved, and that is, that is Paul's fundamental point. Okay? Look with me quickly at Ephesians. Come with me to Ephesians 4. Come over to Ephesians 4. I'm never going to finish all these notes. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 17. 
This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their what? Does Paul say, is it appropriate for the believer to walk in the same manner of life that we walked in before we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? The answer is what? No. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all manner of uncleanness with greediness. Now look at verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Folks, your old man, my old man, is a dog. What is it that your old man and that my old man, that my flesh, that your flesh, that our old nature, what is it that it wants? It wants to wallow in the filth of every imaginable sin as it heaps pleasure upon itself. For its own purposes, for its own means, and it doesn't care anything really about the things of others. Its primary focus is me, myself, and I. And Paul says here, he says in verse 20, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning what? The former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, According to the deceitful lust. Folks, do you want to know something that your old man, that my old man, the only thing it knows how to do is sin? That's it. That's the only thing it knows how to do. It's programmed to do that. That's the only thing it knows how to do is sin. Paul says, put it off. Get it out of there. Get rid of that. Don't function in that identity. Don't walk in your old man. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, and that she put on the what? The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, folks, here's the difference. Does an unbeliever have a new man? Does an unbeliever have a new nature? What's the answer? No. So their flesh programming, their old nature, only knows how to do what? One thing and one thing only, and that is serve self. But now you and I as believers, we now have an interesting thing going on inside of us where we have been given a new man and a new nature. And the new man and the new nature, which operate on the basis of the Spirit, are at war with the, the flesh and the old nature and the old man, and they're contrary the one to the other, and one wants to go one way, and the other one wants to go what? Now, are you going to have victory over that old nature by taking it and putting it under a law system? You know what you're going to do that old nature? You're going to make it thrive. If you do that, how do I know? Galatians chapter 5, verse 18 said, I told you to write it on your mind and now I can't remember it. If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under what? The law. The old man loves works. The old man loves performance because the old man likes to say, You see what I did? The new nature and the new man is at war with that stuff. And so the believer then has to make a choice. Are we going to function and operate in the old man, the old nature, the old identity, the old flesh programming? Or are we going to function and operate in our new man, our renewed mind, and the new, on the basis of a new spirit that's been given to us freely in Christ Jesus? Now, <coughs> so then... Why, see, I kind of already answered this, got ahead of myself a little bit, but why do we continue then to walk in sin? 
Why is it so easy to do? How many of you often find it so much easier to just do the wrong thing than the right thing? All the time. Come with me if you would. Come to, come to Romans 7. Come to Romans 7. Romans 7, verse, uh, verse 18. Romans 7. Verse 18. Look with me at Romans 7, verse 18. Paul, Paul is very candid here. He says, verse 18, For I know that in me, that he's very specific, that is in my what? Flesh dwelleth no good thing. Folks, where does your sin nature reside? Your sin nature resides in your flesh. This stuff right here. Okay? This flesh, your sin nature, my sin nature, it resides in the flesh. The Apostle Paul says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And then he says, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I what? Find not. For the good that I would, I do not. Sound familiar? But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now watch verse 21. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, that's in his flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of what? Sin, which is where? Paul says that the reason why he, he so often ends up doing the wrong thing when he wants to do what's right and he even knows what the right thing to do is, is because there is an internal struggle within him that's going on in the mind, and that there is what he calls the law of sin that is located in his members that is constantly pulling him toward what? Sin. Now look at the chart here. In the flesh dwells the law of sin. I messed it up. I wanted to do it the other way first, but that's fine. You've heard of gravity, correct? What is the law of gravity? What's going to happen if I let go of this? What's going to happen if I let go of this? What if I do it again? Now, is it going to happen that way every time? Is that a natural law? Is that the way it functions every time? So gravity is a natural law. And, and as a natural law, it pulls objects toward the earth because that's where we live, right? Well, the law of sin, folks, the law of sin is also a natural law. And the law of sin pulls you and I as believer towards what? Sin. Towards fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Does everybody see that? The law of sin is at work in our members is a natural law. And like the law of gravity, which pulls things down, the law of sin pulls the believer's flesh toward the only thing it knows how to do, and that is to sin. How then does one overcome the force of the law of sin has upon the life of the believer? Folks, can gravity be overcome? Some of you remember when I used this illustration about three years ago, I took a paper airplane and crashed into that tree over there. But thrust and lift and so forth, by functioning on the basis of a, of a greater law, can the law of gravity be overcome? So if the law of sin in the life of the believer is constantly at war in the mind and pulling the believer towards sin, then how does the believer overcome the law of sin? The believer overcomes the law of sin by functioning on the basis of a higher spiritual law. Come with me to Romans 8. 
Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from what? Now the law of sin, go back to chapter 7 and look at verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of what? The law of sin, go back to the other slide here. The law of sin is always going to pull you and I toward what? How do we overcome the law of sin? By putting ourselves under the law? No. We overcome the law of sin by functioning and walking in the Spirit and going to verse, go back to chapter 8, verse 1. Verse 2, I'm sorry. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from what? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after what? When you and I choose by faith to walk in the Spirit, you know what that you know what does? It fulfills the righteousness of the law. Folks, the law of sin pulls naturally the believer toward sin, but you know what? The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus naturally pulls the believer towards the righteousness of God being fulfilled in us. How do you overcome one law? How do you overcome the law of sin? By striving and fussing and fuming and trying to put yourself under more regulations and try harder and do more and so on and so forth? Or do you just, by faith, walk in the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus? Because when we do that, verse 2 says, we're made free from the law of what? Sin and death. Some of you might be wondering what these balloons are for. And I think I'm going to hold off on that till the end. Come, we're almost done. Come to Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. When we walk in the Spirit, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. This is not accomplished by following the law because the law is not for us. Rather, it is accomplished by walking in the Spirit on the basis of grace. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised, with a circumcision made how? Without hands. In the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who? Please look at the slide above me. You and I, we possess a body, a soul, and a what? When we got saved, when we trusted the finished work of Christ on the cross here, God the Holy Spirit performed a spiritual operation on us whereby our soul and our spirit were cut away from our what? Flesh. And the law of sin resides where? Now, if you have, if you have been circumcised, and, and, and if your soul and spirit, according to Colossians 2.11, have been cut away, have been, have been removed in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, now there is a new nature here, there is a new identity given to the believer, where, where sin here no longer has to have what? Dominion. Why? Because of our identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made it possible for us to henceforth not serve what? When we were in our natural state, did we have any choice? No. In conclusion, I want you to come with me to Romans 6.
Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. See, we're dead to what? We've been cut away from the body of the sins of the flesh. We are now dead to sin. The law of sin no longer has to have what? Dominion. He says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed on the sea. You know what the word reckon means? The word reckon means to deal with reality. Okay? How many of you reckon or reconcile your bank, your checkbook? Now, if I reckon that my bank book has $100 in it, and it doesn't, am I deceiving myself? Yeah. You're not, you, you, you go to the bank and say, oh, but mine says I have $100. They're going to say, yeah, great, take a hike. Right? Isn't that what they're going to say? The word reckon means to deal with reality. I reckon that my bank book has, has $100 in it. It has $100 in it. Otherwise, I'm deceiving myself. This word refers, to, to, uh, refers more to fact than opinion. In the context, Paul is saying that there are some truths that we need to practically reckon by faith. Impute as true. Paul says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Folks, you and I, what we have to do is believe God. God said that He crucified your old man with Him on the cross. He said that through the circumcision made without hands, he cut the body of he cut you away from the body of sin that resides in the flesh. And he said that through the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, we're, we, we're free from the law of sin and death, and that when we follow that, we fulfill the righteousness of God. You either believe that or you don't. But once you believed it. Once you've understood it, now you have to take the next step and you have to reckon it to be so. And when you reckon it to be so, what you're doing is you're taking a stand on, by faith in some positional truth that God has said is true about you. Now, I'll be honest with you. I wake up tomorrow morning and I might not feel in my flesh very close to God or feel like He's done anything for me, but when I read these verses, these verses remind me of what is true about me. Verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments as unrighteous unto, uh, of unrighteous unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For ye are not under the law, but under what? Folks, The law of sin, don't float away on me. The law of sin is a natural law, right? It's like gravity. If I let go of this, what's going to happen? The law of sin is always going to pull you toward what? Sin. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of what? I want you to look at this. Where do those balloons want to go? Where do they want to go? What's that weight doing? So you have one force going this way, and another force going what? Galatians chapter 5. The spirit and the flesh are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you want. The law of sin wants to, wants to continually pull you where? Towards sin? The law of the life of the Spirit of Christ Jesus wants to pull you where? See, 
And what we need to do is we need to reckon ourselves dead to what? Sin, so that we can be made alive by Christ. Don't pop. Okay? Because when we function, how do we defeat sin? We don't defeat sin by putting ourselves under the law, because by putting ourselves under the law, all we do is strengthen this flesh right here. We reckon things to be true that God says about us, and then we by faith operate on the basis of those things. And when we do that, we set free the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets us free from the law of what? Sin and death. And when we do that, we fulfill the righteousness of the law in us through Jesus Christ. You understand that? I hope you do. Because in my opinion, there's nothing better in this life than the understanding that God loves you and He died for your sin and that He made it so you don't, you and I no longer have to serve sin. You can struggle, you can fuss, you can fume all you want to, but the answer to victory over sin is to function on the basis of a higher spiritual law and principle. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You've been watching Just Grace It, a production of Grace Life Bible Church. Salvation is free. Put your faith in the shed blood of Christ as the only payment for your sins. If you are interested in joining a community of believers who rejoice in who God has made them in Jesus Christ, call or write to us or visit us online at justgraceit.com.